Well, good morning, everyone. Sure is good to be in the house of the Lord this morning, isn't it? Oh, it was just such a wonderful time of worship and just so wonderful to hear so many prayers going out. You know, I think that if there's something the North American church suffers from, it's not that we pray too much, it's that we pray too little. And so it was just so good to, to hear those prayers and to sing these worship songs with you. Well, if you have a Bible, you can turn them with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 7. And we're going to be looking at verses 25 through 35 to consider what the Bible says about singleness. Over the past few weeks, I've been speaking on the family, and we've looked at the roles uh, for husbands and the roles that God has given to wives, and then our responsibility as parents to raise our children in the instruction and admonition of the Lord. And then we also looked at what the Bible says about children and the, the responsibility that they have to honor and obey their parents. But there is a subject that we do not want to neglect, and that is the Bible's teaching on singleness. And we have some singles in our church, and so I think it's very important that we recognize that and that we recognize how important and valuable singleness can really be. And we're going to see that come to expression here in our passage in 1 Corinthians chapter 7. So let's just begin with reading it. That's 1 Corinthians chapter 7, and I'll begin reading in verse 25. Please hear God's holy and inspired word. Now concerning the betrothed, I have no command from the Lord, but I give my judgment as one who by the Lord's mercy is trustworthy. I think that in view of the present distress, it is good for a person to remain as he is. Are you bound to a wife? Do not seek to be free. Are you free from a wife? Do not seek a wife. But if you do marry, you have not sinned. And if a betrothed woman marries, she has not sinned. Yet those who marry will have worldly troubles, and I would spare you that. This is what I mean, brothers. The appointed time has grown very short. From now on, let those who have wives live as though they had none, and those who mourn as though they were not mourning, and those who rejoice as though if they were not rejoicing, and those who buy as though they had no goods, and those who deal with the world as though they had no dealings with it, for the present form of this world is passing away. I want you to be free from anxieties. The unmarried man is anxious about the things of the Lord, how to please the Lord. But the married man is anxious about worldly things, how to please his wife, and his interests are divided. And the unmarried or betrothed woman is anxious about the things of the Lord, how to be holy in body and spirit. But the married woman is anxious about worldly things, how to please her husband. I say this for your own benefit, not, not to lay any restraint upon you, but to promote good order and to secure your undivided devotion. To the Lord. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. I pray that you would give your people the kind of heart that is needed to receive everything that is contained in this text. Lord, I pray that you would cause our hearts to be soft so that we might avail ourselves to the molding work of our Maker. And God, I do pray that the implanted word that is able to save our souls would be received with meekness. And I ask this in Jesus' name, amen. Well, from just a cursory reading of this text, it should be pretty clear to us that the word of God elevates singleness. Now, as we've learned from the last couple of weeks, we know that the Bible certainly elevates marriage as well. Marriage in Scripture is, is viewed as the normal pattern, and it is a blessed institution that is designed by God for 
are good. And so it, marriage is a good thing. It's a wonderful thing. It, it's a picture that is to reflect the gospel. And so the Bible doesn't shy away from speaking about the goodness of marriage, but we have to understand that so it is with singleness. And so marriage and singleness are to be viewed as a gift of God. As a matter of fact, in Paul's own estimation here, we can see that, at least for some people, singleness is actually better. If you look at verses 6 and 7 of this chapter, Paul says, Now as a concession, not as a command, I say this, I wish that all were as myself am, but each has his own gift from God, one to each kind and one of another. And so we can see from these couple of verses here that Paul certainly saw something so desirable about singleness that, uh, that, that we should learn from. And he also talks about in those verses how we all have our own gifts. Not everyone has the gift of singleness. But he does want us to understand that there are certain advantages that come with being single. And we're going to learn about what some of those advantages are in due course. But before we jump into this text, I first want to point out that there are different reasons as to why someone might be single. Okay, so there are different categories uh, of, of people who are single that, that we want to recognize. First of all, there are single people uh, in this world who in this world who desire to be married but are not yet married. And it may just be the case that, you know, perhaps they're just too young and are not ready or prepared for marriage. Or it might also be the case that they are ready and prepared for marriage, but uh, within the providence of God, that person has uh, not yet uh, come to them. But then secondly, uh, we know that there are also single people who choose not to be married because they are content with being single. And that would involve someone who has the gift of singleness, as Paul has just described in verse 7 of this chapter. And we need to keep in mind that this was, uh, this was true of the Apostle Paul himself. I mean, he was single. And then we know that Jesus also describes these kinds of people as well, Matthew chapter 19. But then third, there are also people who have become single through divorce. Okay, divorcees, and it may even just be the case that their spouse left them, but they still choose to remain in that state of singleness because of personally feeling scripturally obliged to do so in service to Christ. But then fourth, we also know that there are people who have become single because death has separated them from their spouse, thus making them a widow or a widower. And these are people that we want to recognize as well because the Bible calls us in quite a few places to, to honor uh, widows and especially those who are elderly. So in 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 3, for example, it says, Honor widows who are truly widows. And we want to make sure that we do that as a church. And so when it comes to singleness, there are many reasons why someone might be single. There are circumstantial differences where some have just never married, others may be divorcees, and others may be widows or widowers, but then there are also experiential differences where some have just chosen to be single and are basically content with that, and then there are also others who would long to be married and may be a little frustrated that they're not. And I can imagine, uh, I can only imagine how difficult that would be. But my purpose this morning is not really to address all the different categories of people that might be under the umbrella of singleness. My purpose today is to simply speak about the advantages of singleness so that we as a church can learn to appreciate and to value and to support those who are single in our own church. So as we come to this passage, I want you to understand that there are basically Two major advantages to singleness that Paul presents to us here. The first advantage is that single people have less troubles to worry about. 
Okay, single people have less troubles to worry about, and this truth comes to clear expression in verse 28. But before we get there, let's just take some time to look at some of the details in the surrounding context. In the beginning of verse 25, Paul says, Now concerning the betrothed. And when Paul speaks about people who are betrothed here, he is speaking to to men and women, but more particularly women, um, and he's referring to those who are basically pledged to be married. Okay, Something that would be somewhat similar would be like a modern-day engagement. And notice what Paul says to them next. He says, I have no command from the Lord, but I give my judgment as one who by the Lord's mercy, is trustworthy. Now, when Paul says he has no command of the Lord, he's simply saying that this isn't something that Jesus addressed during his earthly ministry. He's saying this this isn't something that Jesus himself taught about. This is a new situation that I'm addressing. And so he can't quote Jesus on the matter. And, and so Paul is saying, look, guys, this is my own private judgment on the matter. This is what I consider to be a wise course of action to take, given the circumstances. But I do want you to understand that my advice is trustworthy. Okay, you can count on uh, the advice that I'm giving you. And it's kind of interesting how, how Paul says that because we, we obviously know from many other parts of the New Testament that there were many places when the apostles spoke or when Paul spoke where their words were obviously to be received as the command of the Lord. But then there are other situations like this one where he's not making, where we can see that he's not making an authoritative statement that is to be binding upon the conscience of every single person. Okay, Paul is providing guidelines in this situation. And that is crystallized at the beginning of verse 26, because there Paul says, I think, I think that in view of the present distress, it is good for a person to remain as he is. And so Paul is obviously not laying down a rule that is to be followed in every possible situation and circumstance. He is providing counsel in a difficult situation. He's saying, given the circumstances, given what's going on right now in Corinth, I don't think that now is a really good time for you guys to be getting married. And I think that there's an important principle that we can draw from this as Christians, which is that we need to be very careful to rightly distinguish between the authority of command and the authority of counsel. Okay, there are some things that the apostles spoke that were to be received as clear commands of God, and they're never going to change based upon the circumstances. But then there are other situations where Paul is giving guidance and principles to keep in mind depending upon certain situations. And so commands are things that you have to do. They're obligatory upon all mankind. But here what Paul is getting at is is he's simply giving wise biblical counsel. He's saying, this is what I think you should do. And we need to be careful that we don't conflate those two that we don't conflate what I think with what God has actually said in his words. But why does Paul give this advice? Well, in verse uh, 26, he says, I think that in view of the present distress, it is good for a person to remain as he is. And so Paul is obviously... Uh, addressing uh, some kind of affliction that was afflicting the Corinthian community. Something was going on that was going to make marriage all the more difficult in this situation. And there's different interpretations as to what the present distress is. Uh, Some people, for example, think that Paul was referring to persecution and and so that would obviously maybe not be a great time to be getting married if you know people are coming right after you to kill you. Um, and, and usually when people think that persecution is in view, they, they tend to think that it's referring to the impending persecution that was going to come about through the Roman government. 
But if that's the case, then that would mean that that was only going to take place about 10 years later uh, through the reign of Nero Caesar, um, which is which just seems highly unlikely to me because Paul isn't referring to something that's coming. He's referring to something that is already there in their own time. This is a present distress. And so many have pointed out that Paul may very well have the, the great famine in mind. And historically, we do know that there was a famine in Greece in about 50, 51 AD. Uh, there was a huge food shortage. Uh, and whenever there's a famine in the land, that's also going to produce a whole lot of social unrest in the streets and all kinds of economic uncertainty. Um, and so that would have just made things all the more difficult. But the point is that whatever the nature of this distress is, surely we know that it was very severe. And the point is that the obligations of marriage would have been exacerbated in this particular situation, and that would have been especially true on young couples. And so, I, again, another principle that I think that we can learn from verse 26 is that the way that we counsel people should, at least to a certain degree, be sensitive towards the nature of the situation at hand. Because if the situation was different here in Corinth, then Paul would have otherwise had given different advice uh, to these people. Now, in verses 27 and 28, Paul goes on to give some general instructions to the married and the unmarried. In verse 27, he says, are you bound to a wife? In other words, are you married? Do not seek to be free. Are you free from a wife? Are you unmarried? Do not seek a wife. But then in verse 28, he makes sure to qualify what he is saying. He says, but if you do marry, you have not sinned. And if a betrothed woman marries, she has not sinned. And so, look, Paul is given pastoral counsel. Given the present distress, he's saying, this is what I think is a good idea for you guys to be doing and not to be doing. But I do want you to understand that if you marry, you are not sinning. Okay? If, if you disobey my private judgment on this matter, it doesn't mean that you are sinning against God. But... He goes on in verse 28 to say, Yet those who marry will have worldly troubles, and I would spare you that. And so everything that Paul is saying here is for their good. And Paul wants them to understand that marriage is going to bring some unique troubles. And getting married during a time of severe social and economic distress, and maybe even possibly persecution from other people, is going to bring more worldly troubles. But when Paul says all of this, he's not trying to be a joy killer. He is genuinely concerned about the welfare of these people. He's, he's sincerely concerned about these people's well-being. He wants the best for, for them. And he doesn't want to restrain them from obviously doing what they are free to do, but he does want them to understand that there is going to be some deep heartache involved if they go through with this. And Paul wants to spare them of that. He wants to spare them of the anxiety and the stress and the hardship and all the complications that can arise by getting uh, yourself involved in a marriage at a time that really might not be a good idea, especially if you're not prepared for it. Now, obviously, we know that when it comes to marriage, again, marriage is a wonderful thing. Being in a relationship with another person is, is wonderful and beautiful, but we have to understand that when you put two people together, there are going to be more obligations to fulfill. And when you put two sinners together, there are going to be more problems to talk about and more issues to resolve, and that is going to take time and energy. And so I think that Paul is basically showing us here that marriage isn't quite the Hollywood picture that people can sometimes envision in their minds. And he's, he's kind of putting some realism to all of this. He, he doesn't want their lives becoming absorbed with 
marriage. And then he's also going to show us in the following verses that he doesn't want our lives becoming absorbed with anything of this world. Anything that is temporal, that is. We see that in verses 29 through 31. In those verses, Paul calls the Corinthian community, so not just the singles, but he calls all the members of the congregation to live with an eternal perspective. Verse 29, it says, This is what I mean, brothers. The appointed time has grown very short. From now on, let those who have wives live as though they had none, and those who mourn as though they were not mourning, and those who rejoice as though they were not rejoicing, and those who buy as though they had no goods, and those who deal with the world as though they had no dealings with it, for the present form of this world is passing away. In other words, since the time is very short, Christians should prioritize eternal realities over transient ones. That's what Paul's calling us to do here. He speaks about the appointed time. The appointed time that has grown very short. You see that in verse 29. And what he means by that is that the church has entered into the final era of redemptive history. And so Christ, it's, it's like Christ is now closing the gap. The last days have been inaugurated, and so the divine timetable, as it were, has been shortened. And how can we know that it has grown very short? According to verse 31, it's because the present form of this world is passing away. That is to say, the structures of this life are impermanent. Now, we live in a sin-cursed world, and because we do, death is all over the place, and it is, it is affecting the world in which we live. But because of what Christ has done, and by virtue of his perfect life and his death and burial and resurrection, he has won for his people a glorious inheritance. But we are still awaiting the day when the new creation will be ushered in and we will, we will be with God forever in the new heavens and the new earth. But that is something that we are awaiting. And in the present time, the present forms of this world are passing away. And so the point is that life, as we now know it, is going to be different in the afterlife. And so don't get enveloped into all the present forms of this world, no matter what it may be, because such things are slipping away. You need to come to grips with the temporality of this age so that you might live your life for the age to come. And therefore, everything, everything in this life is to be recalibrated and considered in light of eternity. Those who have wives are to live as though they had none. Those who mourn over earthly things as though not mourning at all. Those who rejoice over earthly things as though not rejoicing. Those who are spending their time buying possessions as though they possess nothing. And those who are dealing with the world as though they had no dealings with it. Now, please don't understand what Paul is saying here. You don't want to read this in a wooden way. Uh, otherwise, you're going to badly misunderstand what he's getting at here. Uh, Paul is not, not arguing that we are to neglect these kinds of things. He's not saying, husbands, you need to neglect your wives. He, he's not saying that you're, you're no longer allowed to purchase or buy anything in this world anymore. You're not to, allowed to have any dealings with it. No, that's not what he's saying. But what he is saying is that all those things are of relative importance, not ultimate importance. And so don't find your satisfaction in them, whether that comes to your marriage, whether that comes to your business, whether that comes to your possessions and all the toys you have. Do not allow your life to revolve around any of those things. Luke chapter 12, verse 15, it says, take care. And be on your guard against all covetousness, for one's life does not consist in the abundance 
of his possessions. Colossians chapter 3, verse 2, the Apostle Paul says, Set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. And so be a spiritual-minded, a heavenly-minded, and an eternal-minded kind of person. Have a loose grip on the things of this world. Don't become attached to the day-to-day activities in this life in such a way that you are failing to live for the next. So if we were to summarize verses 25 through 31, I believe that there are three things that we could say. First of all, all Christians are to live their lives with an eternal perspective. This place is temporary. The place that we are heading to is eternal. Secondly, singles have less worldly troubles to worry about. And I do want to make sure to qualify this. It doesn't mean that singles don't have any worries, don't have any any troubles at all in their life. It's just that uh, their troubles are of a different kind. They're of a different nature. But then third, given the present distress that is making life difficult for the Corinthians, Paul pastorally counsels them to stay single. Why else does Paul uh, see singleness as so desirable? Why else does Paul see singleness as a good thing? Well, here's point number two. Single people can be more fully devoted to the things of God. Look at verses 32 through 35. It says, I want you to be free from anxieties. The unmarried man is anxious about the things of the Lord, how to please the Lord. But the married man is anxious about worldly things, how to please his wife. And his interests are divided. And the unmarried or betrothed woman is anxious about the things of the Lord, how to be holy in body and spirit. But the married woman is anxious about worldly things, how to please her husband. I say this for your own benefit, not to lay any restraint upon you, but to promote good order and to secure your undivided devotion to the Lord. And so in these verses, we can see that marriage will divide a person's interests and tend to make them more anxious. Now, in verses 32 through 34 or 35, Paul is addressing the married and the unmarried. And the primary reason why he sees singleness here as such a blessing, if a person can handle it, that is, is because it frees up a person to fully devote themselves to the Lord. Married people are just going to be more anxious about worldly things, namely pleasing their spouse. Right, wives are going to be focused on pleasing their husbands, and husbands are going to be focused on pleasing their wives. And it's not that those are wrong desires to have. Those are actually good and right desires to have. When a wife and a husband have mutual desires to please the Lord and to honor one another and to please each other, that is a good thing. And so Paul is not uttering any disapproval over those who are married, but he is calling attention to a basic fact which is that marriage is going to divide your interests. Because if you are married, you have covenantal responsibilities to fulfill, and that is going to require precious time and energy. And you can't simply say, uh, you know, that that you're just going to neglect your wife for the sake of the kingdom because God doesn't need your sacrifice. He needs your obedience. And that's also not to mention that we haven't even brought children into the picture. And so clearly, when it comes to married people, they are going to have a lot of their time and thinking, focusing on all these things with the relationship where a single person doesn't need to worry about those things. And so in Paul's mind, Getting married right now in his present day just isn't a great idea. But then secondly, just as a general principle, Paul wants them to seriously consider singleness as a viable option. And the reason being is because the unmarried person can fully devote themselves to the Lord. 
And Paul knew this firsthand. Paul was someone who was 100% devoted to the Lord. He was pursuing holiness in spirit and body. He was pushing the pedal to the metal. In terms of the use of his time and energy, he was going full throttle to be a blessing to the church. And he could give his undivided attention to the kingdom and its advance in this world. He could travel. He could go on missionary journeys. He could just be out and about without having to, to worry about fulfilling any marital responsibilities. And again, I would just say here that that doesn't mean that single people uh, don't have anything to do and that they're not busy with anything. <laughs> Obviously, that's not what Paul is getting at here because even Paul himself was a tent maker. And so Paul was busy with those kinds of things as well, like just things in life in general. And so, yes, yeah, single people are going to be busy, but they don't have to have, have to deal with those. They don't have to deal with a relationship and some of the tensions that that can sometimes bring. There's less worldly matters to worry about and thus more time to serve the Lord without distraction. Now again, not everyone is called to this kind of life. Paul recognizes that. Not everyone has the gift of singleness. He makes that clear again in verse 36, where he says, if anyone thinks that he is not behaving properly toward his betrothed, if his passions are strong, and it has to be, let him do as he wishes. Let them marry. It is no sin. Okay, so if we were to summarize verses 25 through 35, we could break it up into three parts. First of all, in verses 25 through 28, Paul is addressing a very specific situation in Corinth. Because of a present distress, he pastorally counsels these younger people who are betrothed to wait a little longer, to put this off. Uh, because there's going to be worldly troubles that are going to come about if you get into this. And then secondly, in verses 29 through 31, Paul exhorts the entire congregation to live their lives with an eternal perspective. To not live for the here and now, but to live for the there and then. And then finally, in verses 32 through 35, Paul just speaks more generically about singleness uh, as singleness, and just shows how it really should be a viable option because singleness is going to allow you to devote yourselves to the Lord in a greater way, to a more significant degree than a married couple uh, would be able to handle. And so that's how we could break up verses 25 through 35. But in light of everything that we've considered in this passage, how should we consider singleness? Well, first of all, as a church, we really need to value and support and to esteem the singles of our church just as much as Paul does. And remember, in Paul's estimation, it's not like those who are single are missing out on the good life. As a matter of fact, for those who can handle not feeling the need to be in a relationship, then that's not even something to worry about, according to Paul, because singleness is a good thing. God can use you in that state. Look at verse 8 of chapter 7. He says, To the unmarried and the widows, I say that it is good for them to remain single as I am. So singleness is a good thing, according to Paul. Why is it a good thing? It's because there's advantages to singleness. It's because you have the opportunity to serve the Lord with less distractions. And what a wonderful and great blessing that is and can be. Now, as we consider this subject, both marriage and singleness in light of the totality of Scripture, including this one, this is what I think that we should be made to believe. Number one, the Bible values and esteems and elevates marriage. Marriage is a good thing. It reflects the gospel. But number two, the Bible also values, esteems, and elevates singleness. And let's not forget that Jesus himself was single. 
And so on the basis of these two affirmations then, singleness, just like marriage, is to be viewed as a God-given calling, but not a calling that is to eclipse our identity, which is the identity that we all have in Christ. Okay, so marriage is a great blessing, but it does have its own unique set of troubles. And then we could also say that that's the case for singleness as well. Singleness is not devoid of any struggles either, and that would be especially true for those who wish to be married. Now, something about singleness that I think should, that what, something about singleness that I think should have an effect on our lives is that it should expose us to our greatest need. Let me put it this way. I think that very often single people are more forced to find their satisfaction in God, while married couples can more easily slip into the trap of finding their satisfaction in each other. I really like the way that Brooks Waldron put this. Listen to what he says, and he's explaining the meaning of singleness here. He says, the meaning of singleness will be seen in the struggle for contentment in God. Singleness is uniquely designed to showcase the sufficiency and superiority of God because singles are called to find in God what those who are married often find in one another. Those who are called to marriage often find in their spouses love, affirmation, security, comfort, companionship, and intimacy, among other things. For those who are single, however, having a sense of these things is often less certain or immediate. And this requires them to depend on God in a greater way for the fulfillment of such needs and desires. Singleness points in a unique way to the truth that all our needs and desires are found ultimately in Christ alone. Singles must seek to be content with all that Christ is for them, that they could say with Paul that they have learned in whatever situation they are to be content. Close quote. And I think that that's something that we should all aspire to, to find our contentment in God. So brothers and sisters, I just want to say to the married and to the unmarried, may that be the goal that we all pursue, that no matter what situation we find ourselves in, that we would lean on the sufficiency of God's grace and power to uphold us in our weakness. May we strive to find our contentment in God by resting in his sovereign will for our lives. May we strive to find our identity in Christ while always recognizing that the present form of this world is passing away. And finally, may we continually build on the relationship that we have with Christ because that alone is the only relationship that will satisfy our souls. That's the only relationship that will give us true eternal purpose. And it's the only relationship that will help us live this life for the life to come. Let's close in prayer. Heavenly Father, we have been taught from your word this morning about the value and the glory and the goodness of singleness. And I pray for all the singles of this church that you would encourage them, that you would bless them, and that you would use them in your church to build your kingdom and to be a blessing to this body. And God, I want to thank you for all the singles in this church. We value them and love them, and I pray that they would find meaning in what you have called them to. And for those that are still waiting for that person to come into their lives, I pray that you would grant them patience and perseverance as they walk through this life. And Lord, as your people, I pray that you'd help us all to subject all our desires to the Lordship of Christ and his will for our lives. 
Help us to always be looking to the city to come and to live our lives for eternity. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.